Cool, we're not making a number one single here, boys. <laughs> <laughs> More of a number two single, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Number One Crude Mistakes. I'm KJ from Crude But Efficient, and with me is Harvard from Behind the Mistakes and Glenn from Number One Projects. We're back! Hey. Yay! <laughs> How are you doing, guys? Was that a good a week? week? Yeah, it's, it's been a ride. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. When you say it's been a ride, you think, oh, it's like a carnival. Is it the, the small choo-choo train that just goes round and round and round? Or is it the roller coaster with the spinning things and the loop-de-loops? And... Well, that's for you to figure out then. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a nice day today. The um, It's been raining very heavily here today, so I've not been to work. I've been helping some friends move into a new workshop, which was very nice. Did some fun filming with them. Was some... it a lot, a lot caring, or it was actually fun parts? <laughs> well, on my part, I've got a van which makes me popular sometimes. So it was carrying and transporting stuff, <laughs> but I also got to do a little bit of um, filming of them moving into the workshop. And um, what I find funny is when you point a camera at somebody and say with authority, "Do the waltz in the middle of the floor," they just do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh god it's gone power mad and then, and then they, they stop dancing and they say why did we just do that i said oh, it just looked funny when it was speeded up <laughs> oh that were a good old days speeding up video and audio yeah, yeah. <laughs> well good old days and i mean it's quite often seen on youtube as well so yeah yeah, yeah. when you when you mention it it's still kind of funny yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we're back uh, back from the dead, almost, considering YouTube. Yeah, What's we were down there. about today? Yeah, apparently we were we were scamming on pyramid scheming or something like that. I'm not really sure. Well, you're, in, you're the one in control of uh, YouTube for us, KJ. I mean, what are you up to? It wasn't on purpose. I mean, I didn't know that I was pyramid scheming. Just, <laughs> I just didn't... without thinking about it. <laughs> At least I didn't suspect anything, but I did have a couple of thoughts when you asked for my mother's maiden name and my birth year and some uh, weird information there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you always want to, to learn uh, stuff about, about the people around you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and talking about that, we actually got a listener request uh, that we should actually introduce ourselves and say who we are because actually people people listen to this and maybe don't know who we are so well, should I'll... we maybe do that it sounds good because i don't know who you are um i'm the last one in uh, and well except from a few comments on instagram and youtube here i don't know you at all basically so after a <laughs> reply do you want to join a podcast and yeah, why not? That's basically what I know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, you were the last man in, but only about five minutes or so. Oh, because yeah. me and Glenn do not go way back, even if it sounds like that sometimes. Uh, no, we, we only spoke twice before we uh, invited you to the party, Havard. So it's not the old couple inviting a... <laughs> Third part in then. <laughs> Just no, trying to spice married. things up a little. <laughs> I, I've got to admit, though, it's worked. I mean, I am feeling spicier. What about you, KJ? How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, well, it's some kind of spark, uh, I think. <laughs> Let's see if it all goes up in flames. <laughs> so who wants to go first, then? Well, since I brought it up, uh, I might as well... I might as well start. I'm KJ, as I said, from Sweden. Uh, I live just outside of Stockholm uh, with my wife and two kids. And I've been on YouTube since 2019, I think. And my preferred materials are wood and fabric. And I try to move more into metal. Cool. Does that cover everything, do you think? Or and what do you do as a day job, KJ? Uh, my day job is as an technical consultant in uh, power distribution. So I work with 11 kilowatts. No, that's wrong. I work mostly with 11 kilovolts and up. Not all those uh, measly little 230 volts or 110 or whatever they have on the other side of the pond. 
So this is proper high voltage. We can say that. Yeah, yeah. The fun stuff. <laughs> yep. If you mean by the fun stuff, the stuff that can kill you, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a common misconception, actually, because uh, the higher the voltage, the more the security measures. So it's actually quite hard to get killed with with the higher stuff because it's so uh, well it's so secured you can't really go in and touch it but the low voltage stuff oh boy that can kill you real easily and uh, i mean 10 amps of 230 that's well enough to kill a lot of people <laughs> and that's just readily available cutting a a lamp cord so last week's we last week we did explosives for killing people, and this week we're doing voltage. Yeah, we'll, we all, what is all wrong have with a... you two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting to see next week how you kill people. <laughs> I'm expecting spinning blades, and I've also got some really interesting reciprocating blades as well that, be, that can be quite effective. <laughs> okay, so I'm Glenn, born and bred in Nottinghamshire. I now live in Lincolnshire. I love it here. I live here with my wife, my daughter, my cat, and my dog, Dave. I'm a gardener by day, and I started YouTube last November, just for the sheer hell of it, and I love it. I think that'll probably do me for now, Avad. Yeah, I got this proper feeling of the old days with uh, IRC or Amazon Messenger when you got the question <laughs> ASL, like age, sex, location. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, my name is uh, Hovai and um, I'm from Norway. I currently live outside of Oslo uh, with my wife and two children and a very obnoxious cat. <laughs> And I uh, started YouTube a couple of years ago, um, just stumbled into it, basically. And I try to do a bit of everything, but I see I lean towards woodworking and electronics in some sort of combination. And as UKJ, I also want to transition into metalwork, but my workshop is not big enough and combining a wood shop with... Um, a weld shop metal fabricating is not optimal, at least when it's uh, integrated in your house. So um, I'm looking forward or looking to expand my workshop in some some way. But that's for another discussion, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't really understand people who do all their both woodworking or metalwork or that inside, because then you have to take care of all the dust and the fumes and everything i mean I, I just go outside instead then you can spread both the fumes and the dust and everything just out in nature and be free of it that's what i do as well i built my like the center piece work table if you can call it that uh, on casters so i can just push it outside when the weather is nice but this is Norway, so it's three days a year i can do woodworking outside and <laughs> the rest of the year i'm sitting inside swearing at the weather i'm always um, conscious of lighting and whatnot so i'm normally i'm normally inside i've normally got the the garage door down and uh, i just fill the room full of dust whether it's metal work woodwork i do open it when i use the laser because that's uh, that's pretty dangerous that gets pretty mm -hmm. smoky in here when the laser's going i got so such shit lighting so i prefer to go outside because at sometimes the the sun is the best <laughs> best light source yeah and less hassle there is always a battery that's not charged or a cable that's in the way or a tripod falling over yeah the, the only problem with the sun it's it's really hard to direct the light where you want it it's in <laughs> one spot and then it slowly moves and you just have to roll roll with it yeah but it takes the what do you call it one variable out of the equation you just have to deal with it it is what it is and then you have to move on <laughs> yeah it, it's good to have those things that you just can't try to control i just have to say before i forget that damn it my wife was right about the pronunciation of howard's name 
<laughs> because we were, we were discussing it and uh, and she was right and I was wrong. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when that happens? No, I can't go go around and hating all day long. <laughs> I've just come to terms with that the wife is most likely right. <laughs> I don't need to say it out loud. She knows it. <laughs> <laughs> because she's right. Since last we recorded, we've actually managed all to put out new YouTube videos, which is, I think this will be like the only time in the podcast history that we will manage, manage this. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that was a bit of a fluke, that was. <laughs> we've synced up our videos after after one episode. <laughs> So that wasn't deliberate on your part? <laughs> <laughs> well, I I would like to say that my upload schedule is deliberate, but I'm aiming for something close to once a month, perhaps if I'm lucky and there's time and everything else is just up to chance. I definitely try to get my video ready for when the podcast was uh was released i thought if there's any extra eyes on us now's the time to do a video <laughs> i shamelessly admit that so i i quite enjoyed my project this time i made a complete completely unnecessary thing which is uh probably something we're all guilty of most of the time but i'm still going through this uh, cutlery phase in my making and um, so i think i can cross chopsticks off the list now i've got about 20 pairs in the workshop next to me and if anybody wants Another 20 pairs making, I can knock those up in no time. How often do you use chopsticks? I, I never use chopsticks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, my, my, literally, my wife does like to use chopsticks. She asked me for a nice warm-up pair of chopsticks, which I made her. And I just thought, I, there's got to be a, a more interesting process to making them. So I uh, I came up with the quick jig for the table saw, and you can knock up a pair of chopsticks in thirty seconds on that easily. <laughs> so now you just have to have a use for a hundred chopsticks. That's right. Yeah. Did you, did you want any? <laughs> I think we're good on the chopsticks part. Yeah. yeah. Meat, meatballs a little bit tricky to pick up with the old chopsticks. I think meatballs are one of the best things to pick up with chopsticks actually you can just stab them you just stab them yeah Yeah. (laughs) i think that's called a skewer but yeah Uh... so i I feel this time around your project kj was uh, more of a project out of necessity yeah yeah it was once again i was uh, forced to do something because of other people in my in my life Uh, and it's not so much as uh, that my wife wanted uh, a raised planter for the uh, for the patio. It was that I mentioned it to my father, and then just a couple of days later, he said, "Oh, I got the wood ready for you. You can come pick it up." Okay, <laughs> I, I was just just spitballing some ideas here. Okay, so then I had to go and fetch lumber for. I mean, that's that was basically like five hundred euros worth of of plain lumber. <laughs> Uh, because my father has his own woods and his own sawmill, and he, he sees every opportunity to um, to get rid of some of it. Uh, so then I, I brought it home, and the workshop was full with planks. So then I just had to start making it so I could get my workshop back. Uh, <laughs> that must be terrible to have a father that has his own sawmill and provides yeah. you with free wood. I mean, that must just be awful. Well, the awful part that it's uh, the drive is a little bit over an hour away. That's that's the awful part of it. <laughs> so, Havard, you did uh, you did the the food truck? Yeah, um, miniature food truck for the kids, um, and it might be the perfect project to showcase that I don't have a plan in anything I do. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started filming and then at some point I realized this is not a video worthy of YouTube. And then, of course, uh, in the right dead in the center there, um, my kids were playing around and I was just thinking I'll cut some plates just to get ahead. And then before I knew it, it was evening and I basically built the entire truck and hadn't filmed any of it. <laughs> but I, th- I think I saved it nicely with uh, like a intermission 
video segment in the middle there. But yeah. Yeah, it was a nice project. It was very sweet, that one. And yeah, girl- it was. Sorry, do the girls like it? Oh, they love it. Um, yeah. And so do I. And it's <laughs> it's one of those projects where it's not going to be a furniture, so you don't have to measure or plan anything. You just, you have the materials. The dimensions are given by the length of the plates that I had and the widths of the wheels. So I just started building around those until I had a shape that looked like Postman Pat's <laughs> car, basically. And then, of course, while I was building, when you got an audience really sh- like cheering you on, it really helps. And then, of course, they are hard customers, so they keep coming with things to add to it. So it needs a motor. It needs the ability to steer. <laughs> It needs a bell. It needs a stereo system. So, but it came out decently enough that I realized I'll have to hang on for it for a year or two until they grow out of it. Yeah, so it's yeah. going to be a recurring thing where I modify it extensively, uh, I guess, oh, at I some point. And then the question is, I realized at some point I have to get rid of it as well. And then I just stumbled over this... Um, red bull soapbox car challenge they actually have them here now in oslo so i'm thinking maybe a couple of years down the line if i can get it to actually steer i think it's within the rules and regulations of those soapboxes so i think i'll just thrash it in one race and be (laughs) over with it do you need uh, any another two members for the soapbox team yeah you need a to push it down that hill uh, Maybe maybe the podcast can be a sponsor. It's a... <laughs> Since KJ talked about going up in flames, that, that would be a nice theme, yeah. <laughs> what did that project start out as? What was the original thing that was delivered to you that you tore apart to make it from? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a funny story. Um, it started with me and my father-in-law. We're, we were standing on the beach watching over the kids, and he said that if they had um, like a lemonade stand or something, they would make good money because there was a lot of people there. And of course, you can't say that to me. I'm a maker. So before I even finished a sentence, I was on every online marketplace looking for something that I could use to build like a lemonade stand. <laughs> and then it became a food truck. <laughs> and then it became a food truck. Uh But what I did is I found a company that gave away a conference stand of some sort. Mm. And I just called them up and asked, is this still available? Yes. So I hooked up my trailer and I went to work the next day. And just right after work, I just headed over to them before closing time. And it was huge. I didn't realize at the time, but it took three adult men and a forklift to get it onto my trailer. And then I stropped it and I drove home. And then I realized on the way home, how am I going to get it off in one piece? So you see it in the video. I'm using a, a strap and some pulley system to try and ease it off. But yeah, it was a really nice find. And it was really good quality plywood. I'm thinking it's easily like five, six hundred dollars plus in plywood if I were to buy that at the store. And the caster wheels were good for like 250 kilos each or something. So this is industrial grade. So now I need to find a project for those wheels because I couldn't use those. But nice, fantastic. Nice. <laughs> and uh, what are you both, what's in the future for you both making wise? What's the next project? KJ, any plans? Yeah, a lot of plans. Uh, well, I, I actually have two projects more or less more or less done that they just I just have to I have to make the edit work and do some some B roll and some intros and that sort of thing. But I have those have been have been done for a while now. So uh, so I don't really consider them my next project because there's more or less nothing for me to do physically about them. Uh, but I have have another thing that I'm afraid might jump the cube on the other ones because it's it's the fun thing to do, which is all about those. I don't know if you have that problem uh, where you're at uh, that the that the kids are huffing uh, laughing gas because that that's an actual problem here. You see uh, those uh, 
big uh, 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 big bottles uh, used in uh, in large uh, large kitchen what do you call it uh, for foam cream for oh, okay. that sort of thing cool. yeah uh, so they used those to to huff to get high for like five seconds or something like that because that's not illegal so then <laughs> those are thrown by the side of the road most everywhere so I picked up a couple of those and uh, are considering using them in, in different ways uh, yeah. are sort of recycled yeah do we get do we get a little hint at what that might be not yet because I haven't <laughs> decided which of the two <laughs> two routes I'm going down yeah. So uh, maybe next episode we can get something. Okay. Something more. Okay, holding your cards quite close to your chest there, KJ. Yeah, I don't like to. Yeah. Don't like to say too much. Yeah. And what about yeah, you? I'm not sure if I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are always projects. Like uh, I think in the last episode I mentioned, I have a list, uh, but it keeps get getting rearranged every day. Um, but now I'm working on the next iteration of the Hell Quarter. Um, and that's maybe a project that's continuing in the background. So I do projects in between to break it up because oh, okay. I can't really fall into the Wintergatan where I just <laughs> submerge myself in one project over several years. I think uh, that's good it, for you. It would... <laughs> Yeah, I think that's very good for me. I don't have the mental capacity for that. Uh, but yeah, I've basically finished the design for the version 2. And I have produced today all the parts for the wind chest. So I think tomorrow is going to be assembly. And then I'm going to have a lot of time for myself this weekend. And then it's going to be trying to figure out the electronics, trying to move that over from the old hell quarter and to the new one. And if that sort of works out, then I know I have the main designing factor for the rest. So then I can start building the case and working on the actual appearance of the new design. So it's really exciting. This is the fun part. Fantastic. <laughs> for me, I think I've got one more one more build on the uh, cutlery phase. I'm going to have a go at a knife. I'd quite like to make a nice knife for myself, just because hopefully I can. But that's just a hopefully just a quick little job. The main things are I've got some grown up projects at home now, so I'm redoing our utility room, a downstairs toilet, and then the my office because I'd quite like to get out of the uh, out of the workshop for recording podcasts and doing my editing and whatnot. So I'd quite like a an office for myself now as well. So that's where I'm headed. But I don't think I won't film the grown up projects because it just slows you down too much. Yeah, it, it doesn't really feel for one thing, it doesn't feel interesting, even though it might be but as you said, you can't really afford for it to, to slow it down when you do house stuff. And I mean, redoing a bathroom or something like that. That's not really that fun either. <laughs> It's, sure. it's really nice to have it done, but to actually do it, that's it's just messy. And I always get anxious when I do plumbing. Yeah. Because there's always a leak somewhere. And <laughs> and you have to go like five times to the hardware yeah. store to get the right fitting because <laughs> it's like 20 different sizes and things. And they, oh, no, this is not metric. And this is... Uh, <laughs> Do you have the uh, PVC plumbing pipe system there? You know the quick fit stuff instead to replace the copper pipes. Nope. Oh, it's, it's revolutionised my life that stuff. <laughs> so it's basically it all just clips together, just a, a plastic pipe in yeah. these quick fittings. All you do is cut it, you know, nice and straight, push it in, and it is as tight as a drum. I mean, these things don't leak. I put a. We did our kitchen two two years ago. And I just ran some pipe work temporarily over to the temporary sink while we knocked a wall down. We were knocking the wall down. And we've got breeze blocks and bricks and all sorts hitting this pipe. And I'm thinking, hey, any moment now, there's going to be water everywhere. And this stuff just stood up to it. There's no way copper would have done it. Cool. So yeah, I've seen it on YouTube. Also, the Americans use it. And it doesn't look look like anything. It looks, it looks temporary. It yeah. looks like it will. Yeah. That will last like a year or two. <laughs> but well, 
I guess I, it's fine. Yeah, I ran it into um, my wife's uh, hobby room, the room where she makes cakes. So basically, we have a second kitchen in the house, and um, that that room has no heating in and gets it can get to zero in the winter. And um, we've never had a pipe burst in there, and it's all this plastic stuff, which is great stuff. Well, it's if like, it works, it's, it's like works. it's like Meccano plumbing. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. I stumbled over it uh, while I was living in uh, my sailboat for a few years, moving around because of my work. And then I also realized that's the same system that they now use in modern plumbing. And we live in a house from the early 60s. And uh, during the pandemic, we did a lot of refitting and then we just decided we'll we do all the plumbing. We have open pipes, so it's easy access. But everything was all copper wires, and it was like attachments here and T joints here and there. And we just got someone in. I think they used a day to rewire and hook everything up. It was really quick and really good. And now I know it's going to last again for the next 50 years. So it's not going to be my problem, hopefully. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, our house is over, the oldest part uh, is all over 100 years old. And I mean, it's patch upon patch upon patch upon patch. So <laughs> I think we have stuff from all the generations when it comes to the piping. <laughs> How do your houses compare to English houses? Are they are your, are your places bigger than English houses, do you know? Or you, you've been to England, KJ, I know that for sure. So you must have seen an English house or two while you were here. Well, not really. I mean, I've only been to to England twice, and I've been to Ireland once. I haven't seen that much of the country. Most of the big city life, and that's that's always small. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can't really. Okay. But, but 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 I get the feeling that that English housing is is small and tiny, or it's a big castle. <laughs> That, that sort of relates to where I live and where I work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's very true, actually. <laughs> there are a few in between. <laughs> well, it's, it's, the, it's the same stereotype I have, uh, if I'm not going to think twice about it. Um, but we have a 60s house, so it's basically on the smaller side. And it was also... I think it was between the 60s and up until the 80s. Um, you can apply for a government-funded loan f- to build your house uh, because the interest rates were so high and so on. But then they also had a limit on how large houses you could build. Um, this house is one of those. Uh, so it's relatively small. It has everything you need, but the rooms are a bit on the smaller side. So we see other people have larger kids' rooms and so on but we are very pleased now that uh, interest rates are going up and a lot of people in Norway have maxed out whatever the bank would give them to buy them the biggest house that they can and now they're struggling paying and we are sitting here in our tiny house and feeling quite comfortable even though the interest rates are going up yeah absolutely it is a house it is a house from the early 60s so it's not cheap i mean at some point we need to do the roof and then there's some windows and so there is always the house project if the (laughs) other things run dry and other other houses um you know the houses here are traditionally brick built with you know um like a concrete tile on the roof so they, they, they do last pretty well to be honest with you are they are they similar where you are or are they wooden framed houses or it's wooden framed, basically, because we have a lot more wood than uh, materials for bricks and mortar, so to speak. I mean, we live on a big granite rock, so it's it's labor intensive to grind that down to make something that you can build houses out of. But that being said, we have, and I think it's the same in Sweden as well, we have come to a, like a normalized standard for building wooden framed houses. Uh, which are very good. So, I mean, as long as the roof is tight, it can stand for hundreds of years without yeah. problem. I, th- I, I, I took some planks off the wall here to do some uh, wiring 
couple of years ago and the timber looked like it was new and that was from the early 60s so it's a really good foundation it's interesting to get an insight into how things are done in other countries for me yeah i, uh, I guess that's a lot different how you how you build houses uh, just because of the the climate and the the weather what you i mean does the the roof have to be able to handle a couple of 100 kilos of snow or not <laughs> that makes a, quite a difference <laughs> yeah. on the on it on how much insulation do you need do you need to, to keep the heat in or keep the heat out <laughs> so yeah yeah we we certainly don't have the snow issue here <laughs> I, th- I think today, at least in Norway, they have standardized uh, a lot of the uh, building codes. So it's the same, uh, if, no matter where you are. So it's basically all houses can take basically all snow loads. But if you go 100 years back in time, you can see a very distinct difference in houses on the West Coast versus those on the East Coast towards the border to Sweden, because... They don't have vertical winds and the sea blowing in, but they have a lot more snow loads. So you see they have different kind of claddings, different roof constructions and so on. So that that's really interesting. Yeah. I think that was uh, a thing when, when Lidl came to Sweden, they built their first store in like the southern part of Sweden and they used the, the, the plans from, uh, from a store in Germany. And that worked well. Oh, we can use the same plans all over and then they build the same way up to the northern Sweden and that did not go well <laughs> because you can't really use the same level of isolation and uh, and that sort of thing uh, from German standards uh, up in the northern yeah, that's, Sweden. Uh, that's like the Norwegian train company who bought trains from an uh, Italian company <laughs> and then you had one centimeter of snow and everything just ground to a halt. <laughs> yeah. That's... If you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. <laughs> yep, that's that's our roads. If we get one t- one centimeter of snow, our 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 roads come to a halt. We don't go anywhere, <laughs> and they'll often do a you know a, a winter special on Channel Five, discussing the winter of twenty twenty two when we had a centimeter of snow. <laughs> How did people manage? <laughs> that's when the fun starts when you can skid around a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my biggest rants every year because i come from a place further north where we actually drive in proper winter time and we have winter tires but in and around oslo it's they use so much salt on the roads and there's not as much snow here as further north so many people they just don't bother with putting winter tires on and of course because they are icing the roads people don't have the experience of actually driving when it's slippery so it's the same here in around Oslo and the southern parts of Norway. If you have a centimeter of snow, the buses stop and people keep crashing and so on. And we get told to stay at home because it's not safe on the roads. I think the the police had a check last year and I think 25% of all cars out did not have winter tires. And it was snow on the road. So it's like people are so dumb. <laughs> It yeah, would definitely of be zero percent of cars having snow tires here. It's just not a thing. No. Yeah, you get extra tuition as well, don't you, on how to drive in winter conditions? Yeah, in theory, um, yeah. you have like a winter driving course and so on, but that yeah. is just like a drop in the ocean, just to show you how how your car can skid if the road is slippery. But you are yeah. not going to learn anything from it. Yeah. No. My my winter uh, yeah. driving skills are gripping the steering wheel tighter and telling everybody to shut up and be quiet. I'm concentrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, when I was uh, going to to do my driving test, uh, it actually got cancelled because it snowed too much. We were driving on a, I think it was a 70 kilometers an hour road and I can do barely 30 because it was so much snow. And we're halfway there, the the driver instructor called and cancelled it because, no, it's not possible to do it. (laughs) Interestingly enough, when I did my motorbike test, I did that in winter and the roads were particularly icy and we had half the group were falling off their bikes. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds secure. (laughs) Yeah, there was... There was a group of us because we, we we did we booked in on a uh, week's guaranteed pass course, 
and there was a group of us and I was um, there was two of us that were supposed to have a test in the morning and the rest of the group in the afternoon and the two in the morning got cancelled and everybody else went through in the afternoon in the in the ice and most of them <laughs> failed and I got <laughs> I got put off a week and passed mine because it was beautiful and sunny again by then oh well, that's <laughs> a little bit better conditions <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean here the you have the the motorcycle season is just half the year because yeah. the other half just some crazy people out, but most of us just store the bike half the year. I used to uh, work in Derbyshire in um, in the Peak District, and it's famed for its excellent motorbiking roads, and always draws a big motorbiking crowd. Obviously, especially in summertime. But I used to work there and have a hell of a ride to work every morning. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. These big, steep, winding roads. And oh, it's just brilliant. Great fun. Yeah. I mean, that's what you want. It's actually, for me, it's quite boring to ride the, to ride the mo a motorcycle on, on just on the highway or public roads. You want the small, nice roads when, when things happen. Yeah. I used to get bored when on the straight roads when my bike topped out at 130. I think I, I thought I need something faster. I need something faster. <laughs> I don't think I've ridden a bike that actually liked to go above 70 kilometers an hour. Because, oh, wow. Or, or maybe it's just me. Who, <laughs> I'm not that uh, aerodynamic, I think. <laughs> that might be the thing. It's, uh, I don't. I don't think you mentioned that in your, in your introduction, actually, KJ. How tall you actually are in real life? <laughs> well, something has to be a surprise for people as well. And I consider myself normal. No, I don't consider myself normal, but I don't really think about it uh, unless I bump my head in uh, on stuff. Yeah. So I, I've converted my height into centimeters. So I think it's about 185 centimeters. What are you, KJ? Uh, just 10 centimeters above that. So it's not that much. <laughs> <laughs> it's another four inches for our UK audience. Yeah. <laughs> Six foot five, I think, for those who like uh, woodland uh, measuring. Six, six foot seven, I think, actually. Yeah. <laughs> six foot six, something like that. It's quite tall anyway. <laughs> All the way to the ground, I used to say. <laughs> I still would say that's within the norm. I mean, you know, still 195. If you start crawling over that, then you get into the smaller percentile but still i think that's within you can still buy relatively normal clothes at any store yeah i'm i'm, I'm basically mostly i'm i i would say that i'm the upper limit of normal because as you say they still have uh, normal jeans fit me the problem is that they always try to make them too wide <laughs> because i mean i'm an i'm an excel on the lengthwise and a medium uh on the will wise <laughs> so yeah there's always some problem <laughs> so i guess that's where where is where is uh, in some way i got my uh, skills with fabric because i often have to put on extension ex extensions uh, to my pants so they actually oh, okay so my my trousers reach all the way down <laughs> so. i would i would like to say that i'm there uh i got a I got a sewing machine upon request on my 37th birthday uh, a few years ago. So uh, I'm using it for projects, but I'm really amazed over people who actually make clothes for themselves because that's really hard to get the seams looking spot on. Yeah, I mean, make, I making make good a, looking clothes. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, so I can I can chop the bottom part of my trouser legs off and then make shorts, but that's about it. Uh, anything <laughs> else is uh, magic to me and seems unobtainable. Um, I think I'm quite. But late I, did, I did. Sorry, carry on about. I, d I did actually look into. I, I think there was a project I wanted to do, and then of course I was down the rabbit hole. Uh, trying to find out what I need. And then I was looking through, I thought it would be easier if I had like this bust where you use as a mannequin for putting the fabric on uh, as you're making the templates and so on. But I realized now that they make the most of them for women. And then, of course, since they make a lot of those, they are cheaper. So if you want like a bust for the male figure, those are crazy expensive and rare. 
that it's like you have to go into a sewing shop and ask for it specifically and then they'll look weird at you why is this bearded guy wanting a bust <laughs> so i just said that that will be for later i think sewing comes after welding on my uh, <laughs> acquire list i think i'm quite lazy when it comes to uh, sewing my wife's quite an accomplished sewer and has a machine mm-hmm. so if that's ever a requirement for me i just say can you sew this for me Oh, that helps, and you can pay her in chopsticks. That's nice. <laughs> Maybe you should get a mannequin instead and, and, and pad it out to, to fit your size. I mean, I have a spare mannequin, but, well, I have two spare mannequins, to be precise. You don't, uh, blow, them, you don't blow them up, do you, KJ? No, 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 no. They're inflatable. <laughs> uh, I, I actually have uh, two female mannequins and one male mannequin. Uh, I saw one on an uh, auction site and felt like getting them uh, before I I thought too much about it. And then I I, I went and got them. Uh, This was when I was on paternity leave. And my wife got home. Why is there the car full of mannequin parts? (laughs) Well, I... Well... Yeah. (laughs) Are your wives sympathetic to your making needs? (laughs) <laughs> do they, you know, do you get full support for the stuff you make and the stuff you bring home and the the tools you buy? Mostly, I would say yes. <laughs> uh, Mostly, yeah. But I, I keep, I yeah, I keep sprinkling in some useful uh, projects around the house to oh, justify okay. buying all the tools. Um, and of course, my wife like to cook, so she have the expensive knives and so on, and yeah. she understands the comparison to having the proper tools. But yeah, m- most of the projects though are just she just lifts an eyebrow and okay, I won't even ask, and then she just <laughs> <laughs> keeps on walking. Do you do you get to that? You're a maker, can't you make this? <laughs> well, I not as much from my wife, but the extended family sometimes ask questions: Can you make this? And if I can say yes, um. It often ends up in being more expensive and take longer time than to actually buy it. And of course, doing that for someone else, then it's the incentive isn't there anymore. When I do a project, I can see something and I can say, I can make that. And if I can, it's going to take a longer time and of course be more expensive than I just bought it. But for me, it's like the experience of learning something new. And yeah having that uh, feeling of accomplishment when you actually can say, hmm, I actually did it. But from an economical point of view, it makes no sense. No, you can't, you can't buy many, um, you can't buy a helicopter from anywhere though, can you? No. <laughs> <laughs> projects that you I cannot wonder why. buy, those are. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, uh, there is a market out there. Uh, there are at least two guys who said that they would like to buy it. Um, yeah, but uh, it's not really? what I would call roadworthy. If so, you've got uh, it, two it, guys, that's potentially a bidding war, surely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's. Uh, I'm not sure if that's enough for an OnlyFans account, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you said that the extended family uh, uh, gave you some hints. I just realized that my extended family more or less all are are makers in their own right. So they, there's no one really who requests things from me more, I guess, uh, get inspired or and do some things of their own instead. <laughs> so I, I'm more or less left alone to my own, <laughs> own deeds. Oh, that's not, not the case for me. My, my family are makers but we all have our own skills. Hmm. So uh, one of the people that was helping move into the workshop today, KB Creative, is my mother-in-law. And they do uh, lino prints and fabric prints and stuff like that. They're going to be doing workshops. Um, but she's very, very good at asking me to make her things to help her with her hobby. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, and, and my wife's pretty good at asking you know, for things for her hobbies too, but she's my wife's getting much better in the in the workshop, and she spends more time in my workshop nowadays, and getting very confident. A little bit too confident that I... at times in here. 
But that, I think, will make it more interesting again, because then it's a challenge. If someone comes to you and say, I have this problem, and I think you can help me with a solution. Yeah. Then it's fun. Then it's almost like collaborating with someone. Yeah. And they're yeah. To fix a problem uh, yeah. rather than, can you make me 10 spoons? So. <laughs> yeah, I've not, I've not found a quick process for spoons yet. <laughs> I'm the chopstick guy, remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This week, at least. Yeah, you're... Absolutely. <laughs> they say you have to niche down, so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Been, uh, I don't want to keep harping on about uh, chopsticks, but there's a, another guy um, on groups that you probably both follow as well that uh, has been making them out of metal. And they look really, really interesting. Is it John D. Harvey that's been doing them? Yeah, I think so. The, the metal ones with the twist in, they, they do look very yeah. nice, but uh, probably a little bit heavy. For... Yeah, I wouldn't want to use them for eating. But... <laughs> no, so you'd end up growing muscles on your fingers. But that as well, but just... I hope that... It's, I know that would feel wrong, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think that would be right. It's funny, all the all the rest of the uh, cutlery department's mainly metal, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And when you talked about knife here earlier, I, I want... I do like to do metal work, but blacksmithing work has never been very much of an interest. But at some point, I want to do a knife. Yeah. And then in Norway, we have... Um, like this uh, traditional knife for the indigenous people, uh, which is called a samic knife. It's like a big, almost like a miniature machete. It's used for everything. It's like a multi-tool. It's an axe, pry bar. Uh, <laughs> Can you just say anything. the name for us again, about <laughs> Samic knife. Okay, one more time. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and I always carry. wanted to make one. Uh, and um, of course, you get kits and so on. But I mean, get a finished blade and then just do some twiddling on the shaft and then put it together. That's not a challenge. No. So I would no. like to make the blade and everything. And then I saw Erasmus Lewin this autumn actually have a course, different kinds of courses, but one of them being like uh, um, knife making 101, where you actually get to try and make your own blade and then you can keep it afterwards Mm. so i was kind of thinking maybe that's my ticket into making my knife but the problem is if i take that course there's a likelihood i'll find blacksmithing so interesting (laughs) that i'll run up thousands of dollars on new tools and it's just going to branch off into another realm so (laughs) there's always that danger have you tried any blacksmithing at all no not at all have you you got uh, I haven't. No, my wife did some at uh, Maker Central. She had a go at making the nail. Uh, I've done a weekend course, and that yeah. was that was great. I think uh, everyone should try should try it because it's 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 really interesting to be able to make metal into clay, but clay you have to move with a hammer because it's really hot. Yeah. And then try to figure out. Okay, I can fold this out of the way, and then I can do that form. <laughs> then can I fold it back and. I actually haven't broken the material because I I heated it up and then it can fold how many times you like yeah. and it, <laughs> it doesn't hurt it and that it was really interesting and everyone should try it but as you said it it can be addictive so it's yeah. if for me I think it's a good thing that I, I live quite close to my neighbors and I think they would object me getting a forge <laughs> <laughs> and started banging along on on odd hours, so that that was keeping me from from doing that. The the knife I'm going to make, um, the blade's going to be based on a old saw blade, basically. And interesting, you mentioned Rasmus. I contacted him for some advice on, you know, can you use an old saw blade? And he gave me some advice, and you can, you know, as long as it doesn't overheat while you're sharpening it. You if if you see the colours run, it's gone soft. Basically, was the advice I got from him. So that seems like a sound option. Without, yeah, I think, without yeah. overheating the barbecue in the back garden, trying to forge some metal. <laughs> yeah, I think Jimmy Daresta has an entire series where he makes knives out of various saw blades. So yeah. okay. I know it's I know it's doable, but yeah, you have to take care of the material. Yeah, as you say, a lot of metal work is not overheating, <laughs> heating just the right amount on the right <laughs> right thing. So keeping a bucket close by and keeping it cool seems to be a key thing. Yeah, I, I have a, a saw blade as well, a rusty old saw blade laying around in case I get 
I, I feel an urge to to make a knife or a small hatchet or something like that. Well, maybe maybe I'll probably save my saw blade then, and until you're both ready to uh, to explore this avenue, we can have a little bit of a knife off. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a bit of healthy composition to spur you on, is there? <laughs> I, I think I know who would take it more seriously. Favard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm basically not very competitive, uh, but sometimes uh, I get a spark of something and then <laughs> I run with it. <laughs> I, I think you have a definitely a spark of the perfectionist about you, though, don't you? Both yes and no. Um, yeah. I, I, I really like doing projects that I like to say that 80% is good enough, but yeah. sometimes I need to make a project that is like to perfection. So I think the last project that I'm kind of proud of is I make a towel ladder. Uh, so I bought some proper oak and really took time on the joinery. Yeah. And I was really pleased with that, but it takes a lot of time. But of course that is going to be inside and people are going to see it, but when I'm building a potato cannon, it's not so hard. If it doesn't matter if the the colors of the pipes are mismatching and so on, but uh, okay. I I tend to fall into that rabbit hole though that <laughs> there is an aesthetic part of me that is always there. So if I'm working on a random, totally dumb project and I'm sitting on AliExpress trying to find parts, it's like I need some screws, but ooh, it would be nicer with the brass screws because that would <laughs> contrast. The, and sometimes that ticks in and then, of course, it becomes more expensive. And then when you're going with those screws, then I need something else. And then you kind of paint yourself into a corner at some yeah, point. Definitely. I think I, I get I get a little bit of the perfectionist about me when I've spent money on a project. So if I've spent 100 quid on a nice piece of walnut, then I will slow down and make sure it is as as good as I can possibly make it, definitely. That's that's why I don't spend any money on my <laughs> things, or as little, little as possible, because I know I that's won't also, be doing it to perfection. But I, I sometimes do it in reverse, because if there is a project that I need to do and it would be nice if it was a, a decent quality, then I just buy decent lumber, because I can't get myself to botch a job if the materials cost a lot of money. I'm like fine wood materials are hard to get by. I mean, you need to know some guys, you need to know a sawmill or something. You can't just go to the hardware store and buy oak, uh, at least not a decent kind. And when you've gone through all those hoops, you would like to do a good job at your end as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, then, then you just have materials laying on the shelf waiting for the perfect project. I mean, I have had a, some pieces of bog oak that's been lying around for three years now, I think, because I haven't found anything worthy of of using it for. Yeah. And <laughs> with th- with that mindset, I never will. <laughs> I don't have the workshop to have materials laying around. That being said, I have a two meter long teak board that I got for a project where I thought that would be a nice contrast to some other materials, but no, it didn't work out. And then I also realized I don't like teak. I don't like the color. I don't really like (laughs) the material to work with it. And of course, the only place I like it is on the deck of a sailboat and then it's utilitarian. It's got nothing to do with the looks, but it costs a lot of money. So I can't just toss it out or use it as firewood. So it's just <laughs> sitting there and I need to use it for a project and someday something will come up, I guess, where it will be fitting. But <laughs> I've, I've got a load of teak underneath my workbench. I don't like it either. I, the chopsticks I made, that was made out of teak because I thought no one's ever going to use these things. <laughs> <laughs> Let's chop it up and use it for that. I have also got um, some reclaimed, a lot of reclaimed oak underneath my workbench from a, a bathroom, a big, very, very old style bathroom. And this stuff is just beautiful to work with. So whenever I play with the oak, I try and do it justice. And that's when I slow down, and mm-hmm. try and make it a little bit more perfect. Yeah, this is the same here. I like you working with oak. But after I realized that you have the American white oak, 
which I like even more, but that's ridiculously hard to come by here. You have to import it, so it's expensive right. beyond belief. And then the traditional red oak is not as appealing anymore, but you got to do what you got to do, so yeah. that's what we have around here. So the oak I'm using is a white oak, but I, I just presumed it was an English oak. I don't know whether it's the red oak or, or the white. I know the difference in the trees, but I don't know whether the, the American red oak is a different variety of oak tree. That's way beyond what I know, but uh, yeah, me too. we had a lot of oak in Norway previously, but we chopped everything down and now it's uh, what Amsterdam is resting on. And <laughs> after we shipped <laughs> all our oak out, it's now uh, spruce and pine and everything else. So we don't have vast oak forests anymore. Yeah. I think uh, for me, every every kind of wood that isn't pine is is luxury. That's a nice wood because. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm fine with any any old oak. Yeah, I'm I not actually... an oak racist. <laughs> Talking about oak, I went to um, in the village I went to school with in uh, Edwinstow in Nottinghamshire lies the Sherwood Forest, the you know where Robin Hood comes from, and that's just full of yep. you know 500 year old ancient oaks. They're absolutely fantastic to see. But they, they do frown upon it if you take a limb off and bring it home for drying out. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's weird. <laughs> Should we wrap, wrap things up? Uh, sure. In some orderly, <laughs> orderly fashion. <laughs> as far as it's possible, we can try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just rage quit. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'll, I mean, I'll, sorry, Glenn has uh, challenged us to a uh, knife off, so I guess <laughs> <laughs> we can leave it at that. <laughs> I think it'd be nice at this stage just to thank people for the nice comments we got that um, you know for last week's episode. That was really nice to hear. Yeah, definitely. And uh, if yeah. uh, someone wants to give us a nice message, where should they do that? Well, they can find us on Instagram at. Number one crude mistakes, of course, KJ. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> and you can now also find us at YouTube after our ban got lifted. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're, uh, uh, or, uh, if you're at work uh, and all those fun things are blocked, we have a web page as well. I think I can safely say that everything goes under the name of number one crude mistakes. You can find us if you uh, search that name. We're on most I things. Think Except uh, Robo number 10, or whatever Twitter is called nowadays. Yeah, and TikTok. I don't think we're on TikTok yet. We're definitely not on threads, because that doesn't make any sense to me at all. We can't even get that in Norway yet, so... Can you not? I don't even know no. what it is. <laughs> I got a message from Instagram that uh, I'm now eligible for threads, and okay, what is that? I had to Google, and then... Okay, oh, they changed the name and made a... Yeah. And uh, tried to okay, you can download it, but no, it's blocked it, in Norway for uh, GDPR reasons or something like that. Well, when you are lucky enough to get it, basically what happens is you go on Threads, you post something, nobody acknowledges it. Somebody else posts something, nobody acknowledges it, and it's just a whole heap of that, basically. <laughs> so it's just a whole a hole to scream in. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> They should call it yeah. the void. Yeah, you're not you're not missing out as far as I'm concerned. That's a brilliant Ooh. social media, the void. You're screaming it and no one is listening. That's perfect. I there'd, still be some, there'd still be somebody on it complaining about the audio levels, wouldn't there? <laughs> I'm gonna Google that afterwards. The void. Of course the web page is taken, but that would be a brilliant social media experiment. <laughs> no, it's just a load of crap honestly it's i think it's not uh, it. oh what sh she's a youtuber uh and uh, she's a maker and also a fitness uh guru uh, she's called alice pagnola yeah she's really good and uh yeah sounds like an she italian had, uh... pasta dish <laughs> <laughs> yeah it she does, does. Uh, but she had this i think it was a youtube video where she, you could send her your inner thoughts or something, and then she would travel to Grand Canyon and she would shout it just out into the void. <laughs> that was the entire video. So people just sent her things to shout and she just went there and did it. <laughs> yeah, she she yeah. has a, a brilliant mix of uh, maker, musician, 
fitness uh, addict and artist and I uh, yeah she's crazy and amazing I think <laughs> and she's yeah. been on YouTube like since the start I think gosh yeah she started really early and she's recently passed a million I think yeah. and it's kind of weird being brilliant at music making fitness and so on that not more people have discovered her yet because she's fantastic in yeah, all I just the crazy discovered her, uh, like <laughs> six of month ago or something like that. So she makes a lot of things with. She has a, a toilet that she made. Uh, what's it called when you do the flocking on it? So it's uh, oh, yeah. Right. Soft. <laughs> oh, that just sounds dirty. Just, yeah. <laughs> so nobody. Uh... Yeah, that doesn't sound like something well, you can clean. <laughs> When we're talking about houses in Britain, Glenn, uh, yeah. I think it was in 10th grade. We went to Scarborough oh, uh, okay. for a week. And I remember going into the bathroom <laughs> there at the first time because we were living at a family and they yeah. got wall-to-wall carpets. And it was oh. stretching around the toilet. Yeah. I mean, they, they probably yeah. put the carpet in and then they put the bathtub and the toilet and everything. And I mean, Jesus Christ, I cringe when I think yeah. about it to this day. And of yeah. course, I, I've been to England several times since then, and I've, I've stumbled upon it on occasion, and it still amazes me how that's even possible in 2023. Yeah, that, that date, but it is. That dates back to my grandparents' era, really, where every part of the bathroom was carpeted, including the toilet seat. <laughs> <laughs> Just disgusting. <laughs> and even a little sort of toilet roll cosy as well. You know, like a, a crocheted thing to keep your toilet roll nice and warm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can understand it from the perspective yeah. if you didn't have like underfloor heating at some point. But yeah. Jesus Christ, use a rug you can take with you and wash. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I feel like aiming wasn't part of that era either. So I mean, uh, oh, just disgusting. <laughs> so Scarborough, that's an interesting place for you to fin- uh, visit for the first time. I'm not sure why they chose that city, uh, but I think it was like this friendship between two schools. Yeah. So they had they had a week where they swapped. So uh, we went over there and stayed with local families and yeah. getting the English culture, so to speak. On the last day of our holiday that we've had recently, we tried to get one last sunny beach day in, and Scarborough was it's only two and a half hours away from where I live, and so we stopped off there and we we're having a lovely time on the beach, and then the fucking heavens opened. <laughs> we were parked about 15 minutes away from the beach and everybody it just it just cleared it was just horrific <laughs> we just drove home wet through but the um i do quite like the vernaculars at um on the north yorkshire at the north yorkshire seasides i think they're pretty cool the lifts that go up yeah. and down i think it's 30 years now basically since we went there but i remember it as a really nice small town yeah but while we're on that subject, you went to holiday, but we haven't spoken about. Did you see the, any trace of that ginger festival at all? I mean, I was so surprised, right? So <laughs> we had a week in Scotland. We started out on the uh, where were we? West Coast. And we even had a day in Glasgow, which, you know, I thought would be the hot spot for gingers. And I barely saw a ginger person. I was so disappointed. Honestly, I had my camera ready to take pictures for you. <laughs> you can't go ginger spotting. <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> I think I think that's the one group you're still allowed to pick on, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, very much so. I would. <laughs> but not that I ever would, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I've been to Scotland several times and Edinburgh twice, but. I really haven't seen much fellow gingers no. anywhere. So no. then, but I know they're there because I've heard <laughs> the tales. So where are they hiding? 
<laughs> Where are my people? <laughs> <laughs> You're not true ginger anyway. You've got black hair on top, I, which completely baffles me. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, something happened with age, I guess. Uh, yeah. Less hair, darker color. So it's yeah. almost the beard is the last bastion of uh, gingerness. <laughs> I think everybody then again, has I've a... always. I've always said that ginger is a mindset, not a hair color. <laughs> I thought it was a spice. Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> is it classed as a spice, ginger? It's from the root, isn't it? Most spices are dried, aren't they? It's it from the can root. it can be dried at or yeah, it can fresh. be dried and ground, but I don't know. I don't know whether fresh ginger is classed as a spice. I don't know how I class it. It's probably in the same group as a parsnip. Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> what actually defines the spice? <laughs> yeah. I mean, sawdust. <laughs> it's kind of bland, but I mean. <laughs> but that depends on the wood, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I should look up that definition. I have a extensive list of things I need to Google now. All right, guys. Thanks for mm. listening. We'll see you again oh, next thank week. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Cheers.